Welcome to another podcast, guys. It's your boy Zep here again. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, piracy, not only in games, but also in general, in respect to a really specific topic. And we have our guest here, Alex, again, to introduce us to today's topic. Alex? What's up? So, How's it I going? wanted to talk to you. Yeah, we're going fine. I wanted to talk to you about the recent issues that have been between Nintendo and private emulator developers. And piracy comes into this because, well, we all grew around piracy. That's a fact. Of course. <laughs> Ever since we were little kids, like most of the things we used to see in our country were pirated. Like we didn't have access directly to a lot of shows and a lot of cartoons and games that other countries had. So most of the things we had access to came from CDs that we bought off the streets, <laughs> off brand <laughs> and not in official stores. And today we've been following this case with a emulator called Yuzu which is from the same team that created the Citra emulator. So Yuzu and Citra are both, obviously, emulators that emulate Nintendo consoles. Citra is a Nintendo 3DS emulator, and Yuzu is a Switch emulator. So what happened? Basically, because of a series of events where Nintendo got wind that Yuzu was being used to run games from the Switch system on the PC and also on the Steam Deck, Nintendo decided to take legal actions against them. This started after the new Zelda game, Tears of the Kingdom, was basically emulated before the game even came out on stores because someone on the distribution chain uh, managed to get a copy of it and put it on the internet. And someone was able to get a copy of it. Some people made some patches and mods and decided to publish it online. And before the game even came out, a lot of people were already playing and posting their gameplays. Uh, footage on PC. And yeah, that is an issue. Yeah, you know, Nintendo is not going to forgive that. Nintendo did not take this well. They decided that we're going to have to do something about it. And Nintendo has, has known about Yuzu for a long time, but only after this Zelda debacle did they decide to take action. There have been a lot of actions by Nintendo related to the emulator uh, in terms of uh, many outlets for news and also tech reviews on YouTube, trying to put footage of games running on the Yuzu. And Nintendo took a lot of them down with the DMCA. And they also tried going, out, going after the, the emulator for a long time, but didn't, they didn't have a solid case. Eventually, they managed to sneak into their private Discord and found that they were also distributing uh, ESO files, which is essentially the raw game, uh, to be mm -hmm. run on the emulator, which is obviously the crime here because Technically, nothing stops you from uh, creating your own emulator and using it to emulate a real system. The main problem is when you're actually distributing pirated material. Yeah, of course. So, obviously, legally, if you have a game, a physical game or a game you downloaded it, uh, that you have on a console, nothing stops you from making a physical or a digital copy and then running it elsewhere because you bought that game. You paid yeah. the 60 or 70 bucks for it. Legally, it's yours. There's nothing stopping you from running it elsewhere. However, yeah, that's the, the general user... rule on most countries uh, when it comes to piracy. Exactly, exactly. In our country in specific, it's even weaker than that because technically, unless you're, unless you're distributing something pirated or something illegal, you can't be arrested mm -hmm. for it. So when it came to the Switch emulator, there were two main, main issues. The distribution of ISOs in their official server, Discord server, I mean, and mm -hmm. the distribution of access keys that could be used to root the Switch console, which were private developer keys that they should never have access to because they're basically used to bypass any kind of uh, uh, protection service that stops piracy. Yeah. So that's another issue because a lot of the, I don't know if you ever tried an emulator, but they yeah, I've tried a, a few ones in, in the past, but it was mostly for uh, old consoles. You know, like uh, yeah. Visual Boy Advance, the other one for the Nintendo DS. I, I don't remember which is the one for the Nintendo DS, but I do know that, for example, if you want to emulate a PlayStation 2, you need a bunch of BIOS files and other yeah, systems true. that they don't come with the emulator, so you have to find them yourself. Mm -hmm because they're part of the issue, essentially. 
uh, you can't uh, legally distribute this because the PlayStation 2 software is in fact private software. So you're also pirating that software. Yeah, it's uh, it's copyrighted, right? Exactly, exactly. So you can't just make a copy of your PlayStation 2 system and send it to someone else. You can, in fact, make a copy of it and play it yourself on your emulator. But of course, that's a lot harder than just downloading a file from the internet. So a lot of people don't do it. A lot of mm -hmm. people would rather go with the download than trying to copy their own consoles. The matter of fact is that a lot of people play on emulators because they don't want to buy the real game. Because mm -hmm. even when you're talking about Persona 3, I don't know if you heard about it. There's yeah, recently I've, I've been, heard. Yeah, recently I believe it's called Persona 3 Reloaded, which is like a, a remaster. The remake? Like, it's not is a remake. Is it remake or remaster? I believe it's a remaster of one of the many versions of Persona 3 that exists. Okay, okay. Uh, it was Yeah, it was ported to PC with some additional content. And a lot of people still argue that one of the other versions of the Persona 3 games is the better one. Uh, but in fact, they just use it as a way to not pay the 70 bucks for mm. Persona 3 and they just pl play on the emulator, even though this game is available right now on Steam, for example. Right. Another issue is that maybe you really don't like the Switch. Maybe you don't want to play on the Switch. There are a lot of issues with the Switch console, as you know. A lot True. of performance issues. I remember when the Switch came out and we were out in a bar and we decided to play the Zelda game, which is new back there. It was Breath and of the I Wild. And I remember that. That was yeah, the, we, the example that I was thinking about. And we decided to play it on the bar. And I remember that we went to some place with a lot of grass and the frame drop fell and the game crashed. Y yeah, <laughs> it dropped to, to like 20 frames per second, just walking on a grass field. An Maybe empty grass lower. field. It was ridiculous. It and was as far bad. as I know, in terms of performance, uh, the Switch is not much better than uh, it was at the time. So I, I kind of understand that not many people want to buy the Switch. Yeah, that's a serious issue. And I remember that we also tried to play a Bomberman game. And even the Bomberman game crashed. <laughs> I remember that one too. Yeah, and it was pretty bad because there was no like warning that it had crashed. It just went back to the menu or rebooted yeah. or something like that. We were like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if a game can't run Bomberman, there's something wrong with it. <laughs> there's something very, very because, wrong. Yeah, because I had a game, with, I had a PC with Windows 98 and I was able to play <laughs> Bomberman, Atomic Bomberman just fine on the PC. <laughs> And it had like, what, 8 to 20 bots running at the same time. So it's pretty crazy that the game can't handle four people playing simultaneously. True, true that. It's, it's Bomberman. It's not very uh, graphically demanding. And the same game already existed on the PlayStation 4 and it ran just fine. So why would you not play the PlayStation 4 version instead? True, true. Like, yeah, I, I so loved when I heard that uh, they were gonna get Dark Souls Remastered for the Switch. You know that Dark Souls Remastered, it's not super heavy, but it had some performance issues. And I was like, so you're going to play Dark Souls Remastered on 30 FPS and on some locations that you probably know better than me? That's probably going to drop to like 15, 20 FPS. Yeah, when you're you going to try place. to play that on a Switch, you might as well try to play with the drum controllers, right? Yeah, I mean, you might as well hope for the Switch to burn on your hands, <laughs> like... It's gonna oh, oh, right, yeah, while... that, that's another issue. Yeah, to be honest, I can't speak about Dark Souls on the Switch because I didn't play it there. For all I know, it might be good. Uh, but the truth is, there are plenty of places like a certain place called Blight Town, which is like a gigantic yeah. point, pond of po poison. And when you get there, your frames just drop massively on the original game and in fact yeah, i know i know on, that example yeah it's a lot better on the remaster because i actually replayed the game with the remaster version on pc mm -hmm. and they fixed a lot of issues we used to have to patch the game manually with a patch called ds fix which fixed a lot of uh, graphic issues with the game but mm -hmm. the the remaster version thankfully was a lot better when it came to per performance there were a few visual glitches that the original didn't have, but hey, what can you do, right? You oh, can't of course, have everything. Of course. But the the Switch version, I can't imagine how that would run. And uh, in fact, yeah, think... as far as I know, it's kept at uh, 30 FPS. 
as remember, Bloodborne still runs at 30 FPS on the PlayStation 4. True. That's wild. Uh, and me, considering wild. that they released the PS4 Pro, which is the, the one that, that I had, as you know, they could have uh, changed like only a, a line there and it would be running at 60 FPS. Uh, that, that is stupid, too. Um, yeah, it's PlayStation true. also has its stupid things. Yeah, the PlayStation Pro, the PlayStation 4 Pro could in fact run the game at 60 FPS. They decided not yeah. to do it. They, or rather, they, they not that they decided, they didn't go through the hassle of doing it. Yeah. And I've heard people try to defend that by saying, oh, you know, at least now you have a um, the same experience on the PS4 <laughs> and the PS4 Pro. At which point I asked, dude, why are we even, why are you even buying the PS4 Pro if you're not going to have <laughs> exactly better performance? Right. <laughs> exactly. Yes, Bloodborne, the way it was meant to be played. 30 <laughs> At 30 FPS. It would sometimes drop to 20, but we don't talk about that. True. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I played through the main story of Bloodborne, but it was pretty wild, like playing at such low FPS. I haven't finished it, but considering it was the first Souls game that, that I played, and considering that I had to do a git goods starting on bloodborne i think i kind of got used to to the 30 fps you know yeah, considering I mean, that, yeah. that it was the first one i played when you get into the mindset of it you eventually get used to the 30 fps but let's be honest ideally you want to be playing at oh, of course of course like ideally if you had the choice between i don't believe even the people that defend that bloodborne should be played at 30 fps I don't think that if they were actually given the choice, they'd ever opt for playing at 30 FPS. I don't know, man. There's there's crazy people. There's crazy people that prefer to to die defending their point. So yeah, but they have to I be a minority, right? No, I mean, yeah, if yeah, it was yeah. Never a, yeah, for sure. If it was, imagine that it was never a point to start with. The game just came with asking if mm -hmm. you wanted 30 or 60 FPS with no drop off in quality of graphics or anything yeah. it was just like you want to play at 30 or 60. no one would be lowering that to 30. <laughs> of course they just do it now because it's a point of contingency like you said but if it was never a point of contingency people mm -hmm. would always go for the 60 fps of course no cap <laughs> <laughs> but yeah about the the use of emulator uh, what happened was that because of these issues with the the keys and the ESO files being found, Nintendo took them to court. And mm -hmm. just recently, we heard a few days ago, they decided to, it was on four, March 4th, they decided to accept to pay Nintendo uh, a settlement of $2.4 million, which is wild. 2.4 million? Yeah, 2.4 million. I don't know if you know about this, there was another case I, of, I mean, uh, the, the, uh, let me just uh, comment on that uh, real quick. No, go ahead, go like, ahead sorry. <clears throat> For us, that, that's a big value, right? Like 2.4 million. Huge. I might never make yeah, that in huge. my lifetime. Absolutely. A absolutely, no doubt. Uh, especially considering that this process here in Portugal usually don't reach those values. Like, not even close. Not even close. But considering this is the US, I was actually expecting more. You know that process on the US uh, reach like stupidly high values. Yeah, it does. And it, it also has to do with the fact that Nintendo is not an American company. Even yeah. if it does have an, an American branch, it would always yeah, be seen is. in courts as a foreign company. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just how America works, as far as I'm aware. Not that it's legally like that, but I'm, I'm sure that's always on the back of their mind. Uh, but when you think about it, someone like... Uh, who, was him, who was his name? Gary Bowser. Uh, I don't know if you heard about this guy. He was basically developing dongles which are like devices that you could connect mm -hmm. to your Switch to bypass the, the protections, which would allow you to crack the console. But it's yeah, I haven't heard about it, it. It allows you to run homebrew software, which is software that you make yourself, or it allows you to play pirated games. He was forced to pay $14.5 million to Nintendo. And he's a single man. 14.5 million? Yeah, $14.5 million. J just for developing dongles? Well, then, I also believe he was involved in some network that would also give you the ESO files. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty sure, like, it's not just the, the dongle, as far as I'm aware. I might be wrong on that. But the reality is that for whatever reason, regardless of what it is, uh, he's going to have to pay that money back. Yeah, yeah. And he was also put in jail. 
So Damn. he had to go to jail for this. He had he has to pay that money, and he was forced to go to jail. He just rec recently came. Home. Like in comparison, you start to realize why I said that the 2.4 million. It's not even that surprising. I think the main difference in this case, in their case, is that first of all, Gary went to court with this case. Mm -hmm. He didn't settle. Uh, right, right, right. With Yuzu, they quit pretty fast. They just instantly quit. They didn't go forward with mm -hmm. any uh, court court proceeding, as far as I know, besides agreeing with the settlement. And they weren't actually distributing the Isus. They had Isus on their Discord, but you could say that was like one or two, and maybe it was for other reasons, or maybe it was a slip mm -hmm. up. Uh, but in in Gary Bowser's case, he was in fact developing the dongles and distributing them and selling yeah, them for cash. So it's a lot. It's a big difference. But it also makes you think, like. If they agreed to pay the 2.4 million, can you imagine how much money Yuzu actually made selling the emulator? Yeah, th that's an interesting question, uh, considering because, that they were uh, uh, very quick to settle, right? Yeah, because they they were very famous. It was a very famous emulator. A lot of people were talking about it all the time. So they had to be making fat stacks on this. Uh, yeah, here it is at uh, the article that you sent me. Uh, the makers of Switch emulator users say they will consent to judgment in favor of Nintendo to settle a major lawsuit uh, filed by the console maker last week. Uh, exactly. So it's probably like you said. If you think about it, like the moment you decide to settle and pay this, it's because you don't think you have a chance of winning in court. Or maybe it's right. less expensive and less stressful for you to just pay the 2.4 million. So if it was like someone like you or me, like independent people, you might mm -hmm. actually want to go to court because you already can't pay two million. Yeah, so exactly. what if they what if they trend you with 10 million? Like what's the mm -hmm. difference? You're never gonna pay that back. But, right. Yeah, but if they just decide to pay that up front, well, maybe they do have the cash. Simple well, as maybe. Or maybe if they're judges of the company, perhaps they can just file for bankruptcy or something. Uh, true, true. In the case of Larry Bowser, he, it, was, it was himself personally who got taken to court. So for him, it's a lot different. He can't file for bankruptcy as, I, as a company can, because he will always be stuck on that leash, paying it off. Yeah, um, especially because he's um, an individual. Uh, while Yuzu is uh, registered as a company, right? Correct. Well, I don't know. Obviously, I don't or know. Or is a brand, uh, something yeah. like that. Yeah, it's very likely that it is registered somehow as a as a company. I might be wrong on this. It might be very loosely file suit against Tropic Haze LLC. So they were a company, or at mm -hmm. least. This was the legal entity behind users development. So yes, it was a company. Yeah. I also think one of Gary Bowser's biggest issue was that he was making money and not declaring it to the authorities. So that also got him in trouble. Oh, okay, yeah. You know when you know when it's one of those things, they're going to come after you. Exactly, and it was just Nintendo. The Canadian government also went after him. Yeah. So when it comes to to Yuzu, one of the First things that people started talking about uh, a few days after the announcement of the of the legal lawsuit against them mm -hmm. was the fact that the oh uh, the so, sorry sorry the, let, oh, let me ahead. just uh, interrupt you about that um, yeah it's probably what you were referring uh, the uh, not not worth the fight the use patron currently brings in about thirty thousand a month. Making yeah, a so 2.4 million dollar settlement a significant uh, expense for Tropic Ace LLC. The US company set up to coordinate those patron donations for the emulator's development. But in the proposed settlement, the US developers say this figure bears a reasonable relationship to the range of damages and attorney's fees and full costs that the parties could have anticipated will be awarded at and following a trial to this agent. So, yeah, they made quite some money. I don't know for how long they had the use of Patreon on, but at uh, 30,000, I mean, it's it's still expensive, let's, let's be honest. Even I mean, uh, after a year, it's, it's still expensive, but I kind of understand uh, why they probably felt that uh, it wasn't worth to fight. The use of emulator itself went to, as far as I know, it, went, it started in 2018. 
and that's probably when the pa Patreon started as well. The mm -hmm. big difference is that they were probably not making thirty thousand a year a month. Oh, of course, when it came out. Of course. And if you add up like all the months since it started, which mm -hmm. was in January two thousand eighteen to now, it gives you around like uh, six years, and it doesn't reach the two point four million settlement value. Mm -hmm. However, you also have to take into account that they also had the the Citra emulator, which as far as I know, I also believe it also had a Patreon. So technically, I mean, it was probably the same Patreon as far as I know. I don't think there were two separate ones. Maybe I'm wrong on this because again, these site, these websites, unless you go to something like the Wayback Machine, yeah. you can't actually see the, you can't actually see the website anymore because it was taken down by the, the company itself, the creators of the emulator. Yeah, so as you can see, it had a pretty fancy website, mm -hmm. uh, pretty decent for what it is. And they also had a Patreon, which was associated, associated with this website, of course. Uh, you can actually, actually see it's hidden behind the Wayback Machine top logo. Oh, right. I yeah, see. I see. Yeah. Uh, around here. Yeah. So, again, this was making fat stacks for the developers, but not enough mm -hmm. to pay off the two million settlement. Of but course, again, of course. It's probably cheaper for them to just go this way rather than having to pay a huge amount in the yeah, long like term. the the fourteen million that uh, the other had to pay, right? Yeah, because if you think about it, that the the thirty the thirty thousand dollars a month they had to go somewhere, so they don't have that cash. Mm -hmm. Like even if you had it up during the years, they're not going to have that cash at hand to just give it out. So maybe they'll just give whatever money's already in the company's bank and then they'll mm -hmm. file for bankruptcy or something. If they're lucky, they might not get anything on them personally. True. True. Yeah. So something that people started worrying about is that the emulator came with a telemetry option. So telemetry, in case people don't know, is basically a way to collect, to measure data or information about something you're testing. What that means is that you're going to receive data from the users about their usage, about the, the crashes, about the performance, so that they can take data from people with different software and hardware installed, and they can see how the emulator acts and maybe make adjustments to it. So mm -hmm. maybe they can get data from people using NVIDIA cards, maybe they can get data from people using AMD, Intel processors, so on. And they can look at it and try to see, okay, we have to change this, we have to change that. A lot of people are using this hardware, it's not looking so good there, so maybe we can improve the performance for that. And Right, you see that uh, on uh, many games, right? Yeah, and since Nintendo got their hands on the data that Yuzu had, they also got mm -hmm. the, the, their hands on the telemetry data. So people were worried that now Nintendo knows everyone that used the Yuzu emulator. Because when you're talking yeah, that, about that's telemetry, a big issue. yeah, one of the biggest worries about telemetry is that you are going to collect a lot of data on the person's PC. If you go to the telemetry link that I sent you about the the Yuzu emulator itself, so if you if you look at it at the telemetry page at the Yuzu emulator uh, website, yeah. it shows that it collects information about the version of Yuzu you are using, the performance data for the games you play. Use the configuration settings, information about your computer hardware, which probably ranges uh, through your GPU, CPU, what kind of system you're using, but also things like the resolution you're using, uh, mm -hmm. what kind of programs you might have running on the background that might interact with you. So, in errors, crashes, and it can also have information on your hardware. Uh, so they claim that your, your information is anonymous. Unless you right. log in with your Yuzu Patreon account, mm -hmm. which gives, I believe, it might be used for for some. I, I don't know why they use the the login information, but it was something they were using. So you, technically, you couldn't be identified directly by this unless you logged in. Now, people are worried about this, but the reality of the fact is that this option for telemetry was an opt-in option. That means by default, mm -hmm. it was turned off. That means that most people that play the user emulator are not going to be identified by Nintendo. Second of no, all, okay, if, okay. yeah, second of all, if user is to be believed, the telemetry ID that they mention is something that uh, is generated on the spot 
for your session, so to say. So if you mm -hmm. if you use the same computer, you're always going to send the same telemetry ID. If you play on a different computer, it sends another one. And you mm -hmm. can also manually regenerate it. So it creates another telemetry ID. And the reality is, if they don't have your IP as they claim that they don't, they're never going to be able to track you down unless they somehow are connected to the FBI or CIA and know all kinds of things about your, uh, your well, system. Well, it's possible. I mean, <laughs> it, it, I think it would be very hard. But the reality true, is, true. Uh, the reality of it is that people are not usually ever sued for playing emulators because the, yeah. the legal issues behind that like, what are you accusing the person? You're accusing them of running a software, but you can't accuse them of piracy. Right. Or and and it's can't. not only that. I'm not exactly sure that uh, Nintendo can use this to identify users legally. Especially when you're talking about users in Europe, for example. It would be very hard right. for Nintendo to, to claim this. And also, most laws in Europe uh, protect you from ever being sued by yeah, something Yeah, the data like protection this. laws, right. Exactly. Not, not only that, because it would be very hard for Nintendo to actually claim you commit, committed a crime. Mm -hmm. Because imagine that someone, this is hypothetical, of course, but imagine that someone installed Yuzu on your computer and ran Yuzu on your computer while you were not looking, for example. Or maybe mm -hmm. you had a Switch and you decided to download Yuzu so that you could run um, a game that you really like on the Switch that you already mm -hmm. paid for and now you have it on the on the computer for you to play technically right. it wouldn't be a crime so how could Nintendo go after everyone that ever played it can you imagine yeah, the, right. the trouble like they'd have mm -hmm. lawsuits for ages and most of those people True. would not even be able to be sued ever because of the country they're on so yeah. a lot of people are throwing this accusation around, which is very misleading. It's misinformation, essentially. And they're just trying to scare off the people that essentially played the, the user emulator. Yeah. Nintendo is now in possession that. of users' data due to users' built-in telemetry present within the emulator's own code. Yuzu in its current form has now basically become a Nintendo only pot because of this. Uh, yeah, like, the title is, is kind of like uh, fear-mongering. Uh, a little bit, uh, at the very least, a little bit. It is. But it is. I mean, this, this is Reddit. What what was what were you expecting? Yeah, and something <laughs> people don't think about either is that this was open source. So, when you were downloading the emulator, you could look through the code of the emulator itself, and mm -hmm. you could hypothetically find the telemetry options. And you could even to this day, if you had a copy of the GitHub project, you could just remove the mentions of telemetry from the code and not send anything to Nintendo. So it's very hard to claim it's now a Nintendo honeypot and that yeah. Nintendo is going to be watching the servers for this. True. Like there's a, a fat lawyer on Nintendo HQ just staring at the screen, seeing a new IP <laughs> connecting. And they're like, another one added to my lawsuit list. They, they might be working with the FBI, you know? Yeah, they're Never working know with it. the FBI. The, the, you can have your with... FBI agent looking through your webcam. Like... Hmm. Just wait a second until he fires up that game. The moment he fires up that game, you guys are, are going to just barge through his home and arrest him. Yeah, bro, Nintendo is from Japan. They're just going to send the Yakuza to cut off your middle finger or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> you messed with the wrong company and they cut off your fingers. <laughs> oh my god. This is the and price the you letters. pay for piracy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, essentially, I mean, I think this is a whole lot of nothing. It means nothing yeah. for the people that were playing Yuzu. They're not going to be sued. No one's going to come after them. No one wants your hard-earned cash because you played a, a Nintendo emulator. That's just silly. Mm. You're never going to be sued for this. Of course. Uh, unless, of course, like, obviously, and, and this is not related to, the, to Yuzu itself. Obviously, if you were running some kind of network that distributes ESOs or ROM files for the Switch, mm -hmm. they might be coming after you. Because in that True. case, you're, that you're not only playing pirated games, but you're actually actively working on their distribution. Mm -hmm. And that's very illegal in most countries. Yeah, this screw up from Yuzu can uh, cause some problems to the websites that distribute ESOs. Yeah, th this might cause some problems for them. 
I, I hope not. For who? Uh, for the websites that uh, distribute ISO files. I mean, again, they're acting on the they're acting against against the law, so I can't feel bad for them because they're they're already doing something that they know is illegal. And regardless of what you think, I know of the it's law, not exactly feeling bad for them. But I know that there are many people that uh, play ISO files. Uh, like I mentioned, not everyone wants to buy a Nintendo Switch. Yeah, and look, my, my take on piracy when it comes to games is that overall I'm against pirating games that you could be purchasing. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you see a game that costs $60 and you say, I have $60 to give, I can give $60 for the game. Or maybe if I don't have the sixty dollars, I can wait a few months until it's like fifty percent off or eighty percent off. Yeah, right. Off. Exactly. And you can, like, you don't need to rush and go play a game that just came out. You don't mm -hmm. need to be in that hype. You can just wait it out. Like I've done that many times. I've never decided. I've never said, "Oh no, I wish I could have played this game when it came out." That's very rare for mm -hmm. me to ever feel like that. Uh, the truth is, you don't have an inherent right to play a game. No, of like course. Someone is selling you. Someone is selling you the game. Mm -hmm. They can decide not to sell you the game. They can decide to upscale the price. They can do whatever they want, like within reasonable boundaries, right? And mm -hmm. you don't have the inherent right unless you pay for the game. You don't have a right to play it. So just because a game exists doesn't mean you should have access to it unless right. you can pay for it. And most of most of the times, like for example, Hell Divers just came out, the mm -hmm. Hell Divers 2 game. And I don't feel like paying 30 bucks for it. I don't think it's a big price, but I don't feel like paying it, paying that money. Right, because same. I just, think, I just think it's a flavor of the month game. Like yeah. a lot of people will be, will be playing now and maybe in a month, everyone forgot about it. Mm -hmm. that, that happened so many times already in this past yeah, few years. Yeah, you've seen the, that happening uh, multiple times during, especially the past few years. Exactly. So I don't feel like that paying 30, 30 bucks up front to play a game mm -hmm. that I'll only play for like a week or two with my friends and I can't play alone because it's very co-op focused. Some people will, will say, oh, no, obviously you can play it alone. You're just bad at it. Get good. But as far as I know, it's very hard to play alone compared to with friends. So I decided not to buy the game uh, mm -hmm. and I'll probably wait until it's cheaper. And if the game is still around, I'll play it then. I'm not losing terribly because of it. But my solution is not to go out and pirate it, like download a pirated version. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, of course, it's not it's not just like, oh, but you can play the pirated version and see if you like it. I mean, I could buy it on Steam and then get a refund if I want. Mm -hmm. And then I would be acting within the boundaries of the law because I'm in my right to have a refund within the 15, 15 days and also within the two hours playtime, which is, I mean, usually it's it's not that much time, but it's enough for you to see if you like a game or not. It's like a demo, right. think about it. Uh, mm -hmm. So nothing's stopping me from doing that. So why would I pirate the game? So this is the first point that I have. Usually games that come out on PC or consoles that you can play and you can pay for it, or even if you can't pay for it, you don't need to go ahead and rush to play it. You can just wait it out until you have the chance to buy it. However, there's a second point to this, which is there are many Super Nintendo games that you're never going to be able to buy again. Right. And there's a limited amount of Super Nintendos that were made in the world that can mm -hmm. still run. And what this means is that a lot of games effectively are unplayable unless you use an emulator for it. Right. And not only that, yeah. they're, they're no longer receiving the money for it anyway. Exactly. No one is receiving the money for the for the game. So you're not harming the market if you play a, a pirated, so to say, mm -hmm. game that was made 20 years ago, that is not being sold anywhere, that has no hardware that can run it natively. You're not right. harming a market because there's no market for it. Right. Now, if someone recently decides to relaunch the game and it was exactly the same as before, because even with that Persona 3 example, a lot of a lot of people claim, and I can't talk to it because I, I didn't play the game, but mm -hmm. a lot of people say that they cut out a lot of things from the original version and they also changed some translations. If you want to argue that you want to have the original experience, that's something I can get behind. Like, if you're not just doing it to circumvent having to pay for the game. If right, you genuinely right. believe, and a lot of people that believe that have played the game when it came out at that time, so they did pay for the game at some point. I don't think it's unfair 
or it should be illegal for you to just play that game. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I can agree with that. Like, the last few episodes I talked to you about how I played Tales of Fantasia and it had a crazy translation. Right. Yeah, that game was never launched in the West, the Super Nintendo version. Mm -hmm. And even today, it's Super Nintendo. I can't buy the game. And even if I buy it, it came from Japan. I can never play the game and understand what I'm doing unless I learn Japanese. True. That is implying that you could run the Japanese game, which it does depend on the consoles. Uh, I believe maybe some I... some don't have issues with it. Uh, others like, uh, especially I think it's Sony consoles. You might have issues uh, running games from other regions. Yeah, I'm actually wrong. not sure. I might not. I'm not sure about the Super Nintendo. I don't think Super Nintendo had a region lock. I might be wrong on that. But if the game, if Tales of Fantasia came out for the for the Steam, for Steam, for the PC, mm -hmm. maybe I would buy it and maybe I would play it there. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I just can't do it. But even then, unless they release, release specifically the Super Nintendo version, mm -hmm. I don't have another way of playing the Super Nintendo version because it's very different from its uh, future re-releases when they released right, it right. on the Game Boy and when they released it on the, I believe, the, the PlayStation 1. Mm -hmm. I can have I can never have that experience again unless I'm playing the Japanese fan translation to English. Right. So that's a point in favor of piracy. And I do believe that there should be even from the companies themselves, there should be a self-preservation tactic to always keep their games. Right. And I think that I, I can agree with I that. Think, and I think that a company like Nintendo should stop just focusing on consoles and maybe release or maybe just their own consoles and maybe release some of these older classics on other systems because they're not they're just sitting on them they're not doing anything with exactly them. they don't lose so, money by doing that and the, on the opposite they're do, they're losing money for not doing that exactly now imagine that super mario world was the launch game for the super nintendo Mm -hmm. In my opinion, it's one of the greatest Super Mario games, if not the best, in my op my personal opinion, of course. And uh, Nintendo, as far as I know, is not selling it anywhere. It's available, I believe, on the Switch eStore, the Nintendo Store. And it was recently available, but I believe for a limited time, on the mini Super Nintendo, which I bought. It's basically a hard Wino, a custom chip, running an emulator of the Nintendo of the Super Nintendo, so even <laughs> that's kind of shady, but it's sold by Nintendo, so, you know, it's uh, As it you is. can see, even they support emulators, right? Yeah, they support it when it's good for them. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no way for me to play that game on computer, on the PC. Why don't they release the game on computer? Because they're not going to sell Switch just because yeah, they have the Super Mario World there. No one's going to buy a Switch just to play Super Mario World when it's mm -hmm. already available on emulators. However, I would personally buy a collection of, of Super Mario games for the PC if they were on Steam. Mm -hmm. I would feel a lot better about playing these games knowing that I'm playing an official Nintendo version of them. So that way the money's still going to Nintendo somehow. I wouldn't feel bad about it. But Nintendo is just trying too hard to keep their focus on the console, on their own console. And I understand that like not releasing Tears of the Kingdom for the PC because you really want to sell the Switch, that's fair. I'm okay with them waiting like maybe five, ten years and releasing them on the PC or another console when the Switch dies off. They're not doing that. Like they're it, it seems they're that. expending more effort to making sure that the world games are not available on the secondary market than they're focusing on uh, making the games available through any of their systems, be it putting it on PC, being making it available on their store, any other way. It seems like they're expending more effort fighting against people getting games like on the secondary market, right? Yeah, that definitely feels like the case, especially when they're going after everyone with so many lawsuits. Yeah, true. It's crazy. Like even Sony started releasing their games on the computer. You Indeed, can play God of War. You can play God of War right now on Steam. Right. You can even play Spider-Man. So why why is Nintendo not hitting that market? It's lost money, even for Nintendo. Like Nintendo's because business model is 
kind of weird sometimes. Kind of weird. I just and think it that seems they're... like since they, well, in some way, at least, uh, won the console wars, they've become really, really lazy. And I say in some way, because in my opinion, the last good portable console was in fact the PS Vita. But sadly, on the Western world, the PS Vita wasn't that popular. Uh, it was super popular on Japan, even after they stopped producing games here. They kept releasing a ton of games on Japan, so on Japan uh, it was super popular, uh, but here uh, not as much. And Nintendo kind of became super lazy with it, they then released the Switch. You know my opinion on the Switch in general, right? That, yeah, but you can tell uh, me again. <laughs> <laughs> sure, uh, the, the Switch is like a super big brick, I don't find it comfortable at all in terms of hardware it's pretty bad it was bad at the time that it was released it hasn't improved in any significant way it's it's pretty bad i remember uh, in terms of comparison someone um, compared the, uh, minecraft for the ps vita and for the nintendo switch and the performance was basically the same and um, the switch came out multiple years after the, the PS Vita. It's, well, it, it's kind of bad, in my opinion. So I kind of yeah. understand people uh, getting an emulator to to play the games there and not wanting to, to give money to the Switch, because they can't even assure a proper performance. Or in 2024, not having consistent 60 FPS. It kind of sucks, right? Yeah, it's pretty bad. When yeah. You have such bad performance on your own. Uh, yeah, it's pretty bad system. nowadays. Like one of yeah. the the other advantages uh, from the emulators that uh, we haven't talked about is that usually you'll get a uh, nicer performance than the original console, and uh, especially for uh, Nintendo consoles, you usually get a nicer performance. Yeah. Look, the reality is that even Nintendo emulators have their own issues. They're not perfect. So yeah, of course. You are going to have better performance in some parts, but you are also going to find some game-breaking problems when mm -hmm. you're running on the emulator. So I'm not saying it's a perfect option. Of that's course why it's I'm not. not going, that's why I'm not going with the performance argument. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm saying that if I can't play a Switch game right now, I'm just not going to play it. However, I know people that have a Switch and I wanted to play Metroid Dread a lot. So I bought Metroid Dread and mm -hmm. I had someone to give me the Switch temporarily so I could play it. Right. And then I gave the Switch back, so I didn't have to pay for the console, and I bought the game. But now, you wanted to stop, you, you said that Nintendo is, is lazy. And yeah. You're, you're right about it, because when you look at the main Nintendo games, they, the games themselves, not just the consoles or the mm -hmm. side products, they seem to be lacking a lot of finesse. Like, a lot of, uh, how do I say, they're not very original, they try to aim no, for a not. younger audience. Yeah, they try to aim for a younger audience, which is something that really puts me off. Like, when I was a kid and I played Super Mario World and Super Mario 64, I wasn't thinking like, and I had the original Super Mario World mm -hmm. for the Super Nintendo. I wasn't thinking, oh, this is a game made for me because I'm a kid. Even right. nowadays, if I play Super Mario World and Super Mario 64, I'm not thinking this game was made for a kid. Right. When I... But when I look at a game like, and this is going to be a hot take because a lot of people are not going to agree with me, but when you look at mm. new Super Mario Land and, and all these new Super Mario games that came out recently, they each each time they try to get progressively more childish. Uh, you in know what, what I mean? Like, because like there are, I know the, the games, style. but um, I haven't played it, so I can't speak too much. In the art well, style? I, yeah, there are two main reasons. Main, the first of all is the art style. Mm -hmm. The art style is terrible, and and I'm I'm not saying it's terrible like it's graphically ugly. I mean that it's it's nice looking, but it's clearly aiming for the Paw Patrol look. Like they're going <laughs> for the children, they're going for the children cartoon, Bing Bing Wahoo. Uh, right, look, right, you know right. What I mean, and then you also have something else, which is most of these Super Mario games nowadays come with easy options to make it like almost impossible for you to fail ever. Oh, really? And 
Yeah, and I think that when you give a kid, the yeah, sorry, can you play, give uh, uh, some examples? Because I didn't knew that. Yeah, so my nephew, he has a Switch, one mm -hmm. of the original ones, and he has one of the Super Mario games for the Switch. I think it's it's not the most recent one. Maybe it's the Super Mario Bros. U Deluxe, or maybe it's one of the ones that came after it, that is like a 3D platformer, but sideways. I mean, it's a 2D platformer, right. but the graphics are in 3D. It might be the Super Mario, the new Super Mario new Bros. New Super Mario Bros? Yeah. And I do remember out... that game, um, at least in my opinion, that game was pretty difficult if you wanted to at least do all maps, yeah, kind of more or less complete just... it, you know? Yeah, but I'm talking about like pro progressing through the game, like right. getting from point from the start to the end. Mm -hmm. When you give a kid the option to just play the game on autoplay to make it so that it basically gives you 99 lives and it gives you something that stops you from falling into holes, which this game did. So basically, you had For an option real? where you just yeah, you had basically had 99 lives and you had like a special suit where if you try to fall into a hole, it stops you from falling into it. It brings you back up to the okay, platform. Okay, that's like super easy mode. Yeah, and my issue with it, and this is my boomer brain. <laughs> I don't have <laughs> a zoomer, but I'm in, technically I'm from Gen Z. But if you think about it, like when you put a kid with the option no, to just no, technically you're a millennial. I am a millennial because I. You are a millennial. Started... I am a millennial. Uh, I'm the last. Uh... <laughs> I'm the last of my generation. Uh, that, that sounds kind of post-apocalyptic. Uh, no, but Gen Z starts in uh, '97, so I oh, think yeah, you're right. that, that we're both millennials. Yeah, so we're millennials. So our yeah. opinion sucks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're like the new boomers. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, we are the new boomers, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but. Because I thought I had seen something about 1995, but no, you're right, it's 1997. 1997, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not a boomer by two years. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, I'm not a zoomer by two years. Right, right, right. I'm a boomer, I'm in the boomer category now. <laughs> but when when you give a zoomer the, a game to play that basically gives you an easy mode, mm -hmm. most kids, like when they're eight, nine, ten, they're just going to use the easy mode. They're not going to go for the difficulty. And I know this for a fact because I was the same back then. When I was trying to play right. a game, if I had if I had Super Mario World on Super Nintendo, I would bash my head against the wall until I managed to clear a level. Yeah. Uh, and I would go through same. the entire game until I got it. But when you put me an emulator with easy cheats that I just press a button and now I'm invisible, I would abuse the hell out of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's just something that happens, right? It's like when you go into GTA and they give you easy cheats, mm -hmm. you just activate uh, the mode that gives you the super tank and you start blowing everything up. You're not going to play, like most of the times, you're just going to abuse the game. And right. It basically, it basically, when you don't have a challenge anymore from Nintendo games, when you, it's the most recent games and it's the one that kids are interested in nowadays, because a 12-year-old right now is not going to go back to play Super Mario World. They're gonna play new games on the Switch. Right. Simple as, that's how it works. Maybe they'll mm -hmm. play on the Wii. If they have a Wii, maybe they'll play on the Wii U because, you know, like sometimes parents have older consoles and they're not just going to buy a new one for the kids when of the course. old one is still working and they have plenty of games. Uh, but they're not gonna go back to play the old games, which is fair, you know, a mm -hmm. lot of them age badly. It's not for everyone. It's for our generation maybe and the ones that came before us, but definitely not for the newer generations that's fair mm -hmm. the tastes change i'm okay with that but when you don't give them difficulty you're just going to make them lazy right because they're not right. going to get the they're not going to get the confidence to keep trying until they get to their goals mm -hmm. they're just going to quit at the first obstacle which is like, which is something i see a lot of people do when it comes uh, to the zoomers that's course. probably why you have so many game journalists uh, bashing games like dark souls because they are too difficult like they're I mean, too you, difficult to, i mean especially for uh, nowadays generations right i remember i started with uh, bloodborne and when you start with bloodborne which it's not easy souls game Mo most people start with dark souls one i had to do a git good fast so a, a good friend of mine told me okay you have to do get good the hard way. You're gonna fight uh, this enemy, which was like a, a mini boss. It's completely optional. You're not going to go uh, through here and, until you beat him. 
I died like 30 times, like right there. And till I went through the first boss, I died 100 times. But I don't regret it. I don't yeah. regret it because the game is good. Yeah, look, I can clear Dark Souls 1 in like two hours if I'm speedrunning it. Mm -hmm. Like, no cap. I'm serious. I mean, like two, three hours, maybe, maybe less. Uh, mm -hmm. I can clear it super fast. And even to this day, I still have pro issues with the Ornstein and Smog boss on Dark Souls 1 game. Which is like the first time they give you two bosses at the same time. Right. Because those bosses are just hard, but you're going to have to go through them. True. Like, you're going to have to get good. You're going to have to, to... You're always going to have that issue when you go to them because they're very, very hard when you're fighting them for the first time. And even mm -hmm. the next playthroughs, unless you're already on New Game and New Game Plus and you already have the new equipment, it's going to be hard to play again with the start equipment and unless you're really, really good. Of course. So when it comes to gaming journalists, I mean, I don't agree with you on that because most of them are older than we are. Right. But it seems like they are um, kind of adapting this to, you know, nowadays culture of uh, games having to be easy and having to, to have a difficulty setting. At least it's kind of the way I see it. I don't think games have to be hard. That's what I think. Games don't have to be hard to be good. They don't have to be hard, but they don't Ideal have to be easy either. Ideally, if your game is good, it should be good enough that just playing through it will teach you what you need to get through the obstacles. It needs to be clear. And what I mean by this is that the game design itself shouldn't make you think, should I fall into this hole? It should be somewhat obvious if you want to fall into a hole or not, if right. there's a secret or not. Because if you're just falling into a hole and it's actually an instant death, that's mm -hmm. just bad design. If they give you like a hole before that, that you can fall into and it gives you a secret. Mm -hmm. And if they're both looking, if they both look the same, like for example, I don't know if you played a lot of those point and click games, the adventure games on PC. Give me an example. Like for example, you have Tungushka secret files. No, I haven't. It's like those those old point and clicks games where you have to basically solve puzzles. Like you're going through a narrative and they go like, oh, we, ha we have to go through this door, but we don't have the key. And now mm -hmm. we have to find a way to open the door. And a lot of those games have a big issue with it, which is like they don't give you clear hints at what you're supposed to do. Like sometimes the solution is completely different from anything you might be expecting. And when I was a kid and I played these games, I could never finish one because a lot of them were just that bad. Like I was talking about Tungushka. Right, I, I played I a few like that. Uh, yeah, now now that you mentioned that, I did play a few like that. And it's not being always obvious. It's like super hidden. It's like you said, there's like no end. Yeah, and it's sometimes the solution is so abstract that you can never think it up. Like mm -hmm. one of the early puzzles of Tungushka is really stupid. You basically have to spy on someone in their own house but you're locked outside you can't get in so what do you do you pick up a, you have a pizza on your inventory that you for some reason picked up uh, a few uh, screens before a few levels before mm -hmm. you didn't have a reason to pick it up but you did because it's interactable and right. you have to put salt on the pizza slice and put it on the on the cat food so the cat comes uh -huh. out to from the inside the house to eat the pizza and then while he's out you glue a phone to him and you call that phone that you just glued onto the cat and because okay. the cat ate too much salt from the pizza he goes back inside to drink water which is next to the guy you're trying to listen to so we that need to try and poison the cat essentially you have to give him sodium, po sodium poisoning <laughs> yeah okay so there's why would you ever, issues with that. Why would you ever think to do this? <laughs> exactly, right? It's such a convoluted way to get in. <laughs> like to, what did the cat do to you? And worse than that, you find out that it was completely pointless for you to do this. Oh, great. Because, because the guy you were trying to spy on was actually on your side the whole time. So he could have, he would eventually just tell you what you needed. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah, so... It's crazy. It's completely mm -hmm. wild. And a lot of games like this had that problem where it wasn't obvious what they were trying to do. 
uh, what you were supposed to do. So I call that bad design. I don't think it's right. fair at all. Like I finished Tunguska without looking up any wiki or or looking up anything online, but I had to bash my head. Oh, that's a lie. I had to look up the solution for the final puzzle mm -hmm. because it was so out of this world that it was completely impossible. It, was, it went so far that you had to give an egg to a penguin in the Arctic for something to happen. It was completely out of this world. It was completely whack. Like, it made no sense. You could never figure that out. Yeah, um, I understand. So, I consider games like that to be badly designed. I think that even Dark Souls has a lot of design issues when it comes to this. Yeah, when you mentioned the, the falling into a wall, I understood what you were referring to. Yeah, because I think that... And I think one games that do this very well are, for example, the new Resident Evil remakes. They mm -hmm. make it so that it's a lot more obvious what you're supposed to do. And it's not that it's easy. You still have to react. You still have to have good aim. You still right. have to do all these things that you're supposed to. The only difference is that you're not stuck for two hours on a room because some object is hidden somewhere that's right. completely out of any, yeah. anything you'd ever imagine. Oh, you're supposed to touch this one pixel of the screen for you to get this <laughs> item. No, it doesn't happen anymore. And it changes like... It's so good when you play a new game. It feels so great when you play a new game and you find something challenging and you get through it at the first try. You just try it and you, you do it. And you yeah. know that it's not obviously easy, but because the mechanics were properly introduced to you, you're not going to lose because you didn't have enough information. You're going to win because you know exactly what you're supposed to do because the game world sets it up for you. You know what I mean? Yeah, that, that's a wonderful sensation. Uh, yeah, with because... the Resident Evil, for example, even even with the originals, I uh, didn't have any problems with the puzzles. Maybe uh, Resident Evil Code Veronica X, uh, but it mm -hmm. was mostly because uh, the game. Um, I have the game on the PlayStation 2, and uh, I had it too. Okay, okay. Uh, the game is super dark on some places, and I I think. There was some kind of puzzle that I might have missed and I I had to look for the solution and I was like, wait, there's a knowledge there? I don't know if it was a, a key item. I think it was a key item. There's a key item there. I I can barely see it on my screen. Because uh, the PlayStation 2 also had an issue with the, the image that it sent because the um, cables that came original with the PlayStation 2 were pretty poorly in terms of uh, Im image quality so if you want a better image quality you, you would need to to get the special cable and uh, some of the games uh, suffered badly because of it but yeah, in general I've... the resident evil games uh, never had a, a problem with it even with the original ones my father was a is a video geek like he likes to have the best video and audio possible mm -hmm. so we did have the good cables and i never had any issue with the with the code veronica games but i was also already very how do you say uh biased because i already had played resident evil one and two and three so i already knew what to expect when it came to play. right yeah so but obviously like even when you look at the original Resident Evil, it wasn't all that obvious in some situations. Yeah, it wasn't. And it becomes, it becomes easier to figure out in the new games, and I don't think that's a bad thing at all. I think that's yeah. a nice way to make a hard game easier without giving you the solution right ahead, without just telling you, hey, you have to do this, and now we're going to make you invisible, invisible so that you can do it easy. Right, right. Yeah, and again, you can do that with difficulty too, because there's also easy mode in normal mode, in hard mode. I think the issue is that when you, like Super Mario, and they give you 99 lives, and you stop you from instantly dying in traps. Yeah, that's ridiculous. That's issue. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Like, it's so hard for you to die. <laughs> yeah, you, you it's to harder for you to want... die than to, to just complete the game. Yeah, you're going to want to purposely die for, for it to be a problem, like for you to lose lives. Yeah. Like, it makes no sense. Yeah, but uh, that's how I feel about the the, pir the entire piracy thing, and also about the the Nintendo Switch in general. I, I was I was right. going to tell you one thing, which is you were saying that Nintendo was lazy. I right, think right, that right. when you look at the main games, the quality fell off. 
in some games. I still think like Super Mario, I don't think it's a bad game. I just think that the easy mode is kind of lame. The way they made the easy mode is lame. But I don't think the, the quality there dropped off. But when you look at other games like the Pokemon, Pokemon games. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus Christ. And I feel like the games. And, made... and Pokemon oh. games also are the perfect example of what you were talking about. Even more than Super Mario when it comes to the art style. The art style is getting more and more and more childish. And yeah. it's not only Nintendo games. I don't see I don't see this as much uh, in games in general, but when you look at old cartoon shows, like mm -hmm. for example Scooby Doo, perfect example, or uh, other cartoons like the Teen Titans, a lot of old stuff that we used to watch uh, on our times. You look at how they used to look on the 80s, 90s, and all that, and you look at them nowadays. And the world design was much better. Nowadays, it looks so childish that they they look really bad. Yeah, they fell off, man. Yeah, a lot. They fell like, off. Have you looked at the Scooby Doo looks nowadays, for example? Uh, the Scooby Doo one, no. But I did look, for example, like my nephew keeps watching Teen Titans and yeah, and Ben 10. and like the quality. Oh yeah, yeah, Ben 10, for example. Yeah, perfect. The example. way they're drawn now, I mean. It leaves a lot to yeah. be desired. Yeah, th that's just to say the list. Yeah, that's just to say the least, because even the tonality of the villains, like they became comically evil. Like they're <laughs> yeah, not just right. like it's not like you have this intergalactic criminal that's ha going after two kids and he's willing to kill everyone if it's needed. Now he just appears and he's all buffed up. He's like, ah, I'm going to kill you. Ah. <laughs> yeah. but, like it's very it's very like humoristic so to say right, like right the entire seriousness of the threat that you're facing you're not facing a, a universe destroying threat anymore you're just facing a, a guy that's mad you're just facing another friday yeah it's just another friday <laughs> oh here comes uh bill Gax again <laughs> yeah here he comes. for the 400th time he wants to get my bracelet that silly that silly alien yeah. oh you bill Gax. <laughs> Why are you doing this to me? Yeah, it's like it's it's completely different. Like even mm -hmm. back then, you used to have like more character deaths in other things. That yeah, I know, right? Were, yeah, that was serious. Like even in kids' cartoons, like sometimes something serious would happen to characters. Right. And as a kid, you'd be genuinely worried. Mm -hmm. But now the tone is completely different. Like you don't yeah, care. Yeah, absolutely. Anymore. You're just there to laugh at it. It's just a laughing. It's just a laugh, and you can say. That's like at some okay, times, right? it even used to to be shocking. Uh, you used to be like, "Damn, I can't believe the turn of this. It's getting really dark." And nowadays, it's all, yeah, pretty much just yeah, I, cheerful. I, I, even I I... if the scene is kind of dark, thanks to to the art style, you're not going to to notice it as much. It lessens the impact a lot. Yeah, sometimes you'd see like characters from like alternate re alternative uh, realities or mm -hmm. or or dimensions from other timelines or from the future, and they would be all like scarred up and losing limbs and yeah. stuff like that. They would be all screwed up because of whatever happened in the past, and they go back mm -hmm. to change it. And it doesn't happen that much anymore. I remember Samurai Jack, for example, like oh, that right, show. Right that show was so intense like even as a kid i was watching it as if i was watching a movie i wasn't thinking about it like just a cartoon because everything was so serious yeah like, there was i loved always it this, yeah there i was have good memories of it in the air there was a huge tension and the the show also had a lot of moments of silence which is impossible nowadays you're not going to get a, get a moment of silence in a in a cartoon right there were a lot of times where he was just walking through the desert or walking through a city and you were just taking in like the vibe of the future dystopian world that Aku had created. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, a battle on, on a tower that it was a genius in terms of animations. It was uh, pretty much all black and white. Like the Samurai Jack uh, dressing complete white to blend in the light and uh, a dark samurai dressing complete black to blend with the darkness. And the battle, the entire battle was completely silent, with only, of course, the the clashes. Uh, but yeah, no dialogue. You don't see that much nowadays. 
No, because nowadays you can't go five seconds without a funny joke. Yeah. If someone is not farting actively or burping, or going like, <laughs> aha, so funny, I can't believe you, you fell for it. <laughs> like the kids are not even going to pay attention. It comes like that meme that people keep posting around, like you're watching a, a person react to something on YouTube. So you're seeing someone reacting to a video already. So it's not even mm -hmm. the original content. And then there's like subway surfers on the bottom running. <laughs> so it's just an overload of sensations at the same yeah. time. I can yeah, imagine that great. the the new Apple Vision Pro that's probably close to what's happening there with like oh three God. screens right in front of your eyes at the same time. That would be crazy. And yeah. you know, like I don't see just this just in kids. Like I don't want to make this like oh I'm making fun of the new generations because I think like the new generations also have good values in some cases. There's a lot of things mm -hmm. I see good. Like, it's not just bad. It's not like I'm a boomer and I'm just saying, oh, back in my days, everything was great because it wasn't. There were a lot of issues that right. there aren't anymore. All I'm saying is that I see a lot of people, even from my generation, doing the subway surfers thing and they can't hold attention to anything anymore. Yeah. They play gacha games, which are just basically dopamine uh, serving games that all they do is give you dopamine. They're playing anything that keeps them high on their senses, but it's not like they have to react really fast. It's like giving you things or flashing things in front of your eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's there. There's a lot of nuance that was lost and even people are just addicted to that dopamine. Right, right, right. 